Right. I think by and large, by itself, most Americans would consider cheese to be a health food. You know, it's it's a dairy. I mean, it's on the yeah. food pyramid yeah. that we're all taught, you know, for goodness sakes. They do. I, I suppose they're thinking of calcium. Calcium as well. Yeah. Calcium, vitamin D, that whole bit. Let's tackle that. Why not? Uh, let's talk about calcium. Um, cows don't make calcium. You know, people think, is cal- I need milk for calcium. Right. The cacao does not make calcium. Calcium is in the earth. And the calcium is pulled by green leafy vegetables. In this case, I'm talking about grass. Mm -hmm. And the grass pulls the calcium out of the earth and the cow eats it. Um, And if there is calcium in the milk, the cow just ate it. Um, And there is calcium in all green leafy vegetables. And so you don't need the cow for it. You Mm. You can eat the... If you... Calcium comes from the earth into green leafy vegetables. If you eat the green leafy vegetables, you will get calcium. If the cow eats green leafy vegetables like grass, he, she gets calcium and it ends up in the milk. But you don't need it from that source because that's not where it started. Mm, brilliant marketing on the dairy industry then. It is. And it's a funny thing because if you look at milk, the calcium absor- absorption is not very hot. It's not very good. Um, here's my Brussels sprouts. Here's my broccoli. It's over 50% of calcium in the green vegetable is absorbed. Your body takes it out. For milk, about 30%. Interesting. I have never heard that before. That's a nice little nugget. Yeah. um, So in other words, you can drink milk, and there is calcium in it, but 70% of that calcium goes right through your intestinal tract into the toilet. Isn't this cheerful thought? Oh, Sorry, a little <laughs> wasteful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, pardon the pun. Don't, don't zero in on this image too much. Yeah. But um, but you get the idea. That calcium, yes, it's on the label. Mm-hmm. Are you going to absorb it? Is it ever going to get past your intestinal wall? No. About thirty percent does. Wow. So that's something to think about, boys and girls. Um, I want to circle back to obesity. Obviously, that's that's an epidemic. I think now that uh, what is it, forty percent of of Americans are now considered obese. I think that that was the the latest study. Um, and obviously, obesity is just linked to scores of chronic diseases. And if cheese is directly linked to obesity, one then could surmise that cheese is directly linked to scores of chronic disease. Abs- with no question about it. Um, if you're eating this huge load of, of fat and salt uh, day after day after day, multiple times a day, um, it will set the stage for these problems. And by, by the way, it was not always so. If you look back... The U.S. government started tracking America's eating habits in 1909. Hmm. And in 1909, cheese was something you ate in Switzerland. Right. Not in Peoria. <laughs> not in Trenton. We don't, you know, cheese is not our thing. The average American in 1909 ate 3.8 pounds of cheese. Today, it's 35 pounds of cheese <sighs> is the average consumption in a year. Um, and that was really because of fast food chains and, and pizza chains starting in the 70s and 80s and 90s when it's just gone through the roof. Think about that. 35 pounds of cheese. I mean, what, that's what, a couple of cinder blocks worth of queso? Is <laughs> oh, it? it's, it's a lot. I mean, that's, but, but, well, that's average. Um, for, for every vegan who's not consuming any, there is somebody else eating 70. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, Here's one that's kind of near and dear to my heart as well, and it's a topic that you've covered uh, at length as well, is the link between cheese and Alzheimer's disease. It's, it's a fascinating area, and it's one that is, I think, potentially the most hopeful thing that you can imagine because up until now we have had, we've really not had good ways into Alzheimer's prevention. But cheese, well, let me go back. Um, researchers in Chicago, at the Chicago Health and Aging Project, reported in 2003 the results of 10 years of, of work where they found that in Chicago, those people who ate the most saturated fat, that's solid fat, that's mm-hmm. the, the, the bad fat that's in cheese, the, the people who ate the most saturated fat had two to three to, to, or even more times the risk of getting Alzheimer's disease compared to people who avoided it. Um, and what's the number one source of saturated fat in the diet? Dairy products, especially cheese. Especially. Yeah, uh, it's it's far and away the biggest source, worse than we, worse than meat. Um, meat is second, mm. but uh, dairy, especially cheese, is number one. So, uh, and there are many other things we can do to protect the brain. Right. But job one is to get all that bad fat out of your diet because it causes changes in the brain, making Alzheimer's more likely. At least that's the theory, and the evidence backs it up. And I would assume then as, 
you know, the amount of cheese that Americans ate increased since 1909, then also the rate of Alzheimer's cases. Well, jumped. yes, it's been it's been jumping. It's, it's been going up and up and up and up. And people say, well, is that just because there's more old people? Well, no. Um, and then we're exporting this overseas. When you look at Western dietary habits now invading countries that let's face it, if you were in Beijing, grilled cheese was not your thing, sure. you know, 50 years ago. Well, it is becoming that now, and they are seeing heart disease, certain cancers, diabetes, and evidence suggests more Alzheimer's, too. It's, it's challenging to do that kind of research, Yeah. Uh, but all the indicators are that that's getting worse, too. Yeah, uh, and, you know, to get real with you for a second, I mean, that's, that's one of the things that drew me to the, the vegan diet was specifically, you know, to lower my risk of Alzheimer's. It's, you know, uh, all uh, my grandmother had it. Um, her siblings had it. Um, you know, now we're starting to see some Parkinson's in my uncles, and, uh, you know, my mom is just terrified she's going to get it. So so there's a strong family history there of it, and I'm trying to do everything in my power to lower my risk of developing that. So, yes, Jesus. But, you know, as you talked about, genetics don't necessarily dictate fate. Right. Oh, absolutely. Um, there is a gene for you can call it a gene for Alzheimer's disease. It's mm -hmm. called the ApoE Epsilon 4 allele. And if you got it from both parents, your risk of getting Alzheimer's is 10 to 15 times higher than for somebody else. However, researchers have looked at people with that gene and found that even if you got this gene, if you change your diet, it seems to change your risk. In other words, if you eat in a really healthy way, your risk of developing memory problems as you get older appears to be reduced, despite the fact you have the gene. Because what the gene may do, the, the, an Alzheimer's gene doesn't just say, okay, I'm a hair on your chromosome, you're gonna get Alzheimer's. What the way, it, you could imagine a number of ways that it might work. Let's say the gene simply impairs your ability to metabolize saturated fat. Mm -hmm. And so you eat it and it goes to the brain, and it hurts you. Well, if you're not eating it, it doesn't matter if you got the gene or not. You see what I mean? Right. Uh, we saw that with smoking. Sm smokers, uh, there are some people who have a gene that makes it harder for them to eliminate carcinogens that they inhale. Well, if you're not inhaling carcinogens, you're not likely to get lung cancer. Sure. So, so the genes work in funny ways, and f the way people eat can make those genes irrelevant in certain situations. Now, this is still a, a new area of research. But there is a lot we are learning about how foods affect the brain, and it is all empowering. In, in other words, I'm not talking about a white, mo uh, you know, a, a mouse or rat right. getting Alzheimer's. Um, what I'm talking about is studies in human beings showing dramatic differences in who gets this disease and who doesn't based on the foods that they are eating.